Let us pray. Father, we approach your presence tonight with implicit trusts that you are here before us and that you do marvels in instructing, in teaching, in sharing, and that pertains to expansion of kingdom even this very day. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. Let me welcome you. Today is Monday, Thursday. I want to discuss issues of Monday, Thursday from perspective of the validity of the day, as well as from point of view of our spiritual warfare, networked for centuries before then. And I'll just browse through this five or six verses of scriptures, John chapter 13 from verse 33. Little children, yet a little while I am with you. You will seek me, and as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I'm going, you cannot come. A new commandment <clears throat> I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus answered, where I'm going, you cannot follow me now, but you shall afterwards. Peter said to him, Lord, why cannot I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Jesus answered, will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, the cock will not crow till so you have denied me three times. This is the word of the Lord. And thanks be to God. Warfare is simply defined, defined in many ways, conflicts, combat, struggle, sometimes bloodshed, battles, strife, hostility, enmity, antagonism, discord. You can go on and on. But when this has to do with spiritual issues, if God is spirit and we're involved in this combat, Oh, it's been quite a long while. Talking about the importance to, of today, Mounty Thursday, historically, Middle English Mounte from Old French Mande, from Latin Mandatum, simply means command. So when you are talking about Mounty Thursday, you are talking about the command or the order that happened on the Thursday before Jesus was crucified. And it was spoken by Jesus to his disciples after watching their feet. At the Lord's Supper, I said, a new commandment I give unto you that you love one another. A new mounty I give unto you that you love one another. That's simply all that is to see about the compound word Mount Thursday. And that directive is from John 15, John 13, 34, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. So it was a love demonstrated. It is a love typified. It was a love that had a reference point and it became a commandment the night that Jesus Christ was betrayed. Let me qualify it. Before Jesus went into silence of self-defense, see that statement. All the trial, he just kept quiet. Before he went into silence of self-defense of Mount Thursday, 
He spent 33 years, a whole lifetime, defending his pilgrimage, summarized in John 1430. I will not speak with you much longer. For the prince of this world is coming. He has no hold on me. He has no investment in me. He has nothing in me. 33 years without sin. So that statement took him 33 years of cautious, dedicated life to become the lamb without stain, to become the lamb of God without blemish. And before that lamb went silent on Mount Thursday, he had prepared for 33 years for this battle, which he won, but it, which took time for them to realize that he won. Before, when, before Jesus Christ went into this silence of self-defense and money for okay, he prayerfully prepared for the day of battle for his team, for his team leader. Luke chapter 30, 22, verse 31 through 32. The Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. You can see that sift, where some things are coming out, some are retained. Like he asked for Job, he had, when, when, the, when Satan was doing that one before God said, Peter was not aware. Lord said, say, he called him twice. Indeed, I'm witness that Satan has asked for you that he sifts you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. Prophecy for a whole lifetime after I would have dead, died for Peter. Most of the time that Jesus went alone, he had revelations, some were published, he had some, they were not published. Satan had really planned for Peter. You know, when somebody is being sifted like wheat, that means it will be so riddled with disasters that it will run away from Christianity. So before your Christ went to the silence of self-defense on Monday, Thursday, he did pray for the leader of his team. Let's talk about our time in Matthew chapter 24, verse 12 through 22. When he was talking about the end time, he said, for then there will be great tribulation, such as has not occurred since the world's be since the world's beginning until now. Oh no. Now will it occur again? In fact, unless those days were cut short, no flesh will be saved. But on account of the chosen ones, those days will be cut short. Can you see the way people are being massacred? Can you see the way Russia is doing? Can you see that the, the law officer enforcement, they are overwhelmed? Who are they going to prosecute? It's just too much. And if this were to continue, maybe the last man would deny Christ when he sees the sword. Nobody will be saved. So before Jesus Christ went into self-defense, he made a revelation. He prayerfully prepared for the leaders and the followers. He forewarned us. That reminds me. Proverbs 21, 31. The horse is made ready for the day of battle, but the victory belongs to the Lord. You can see that horse excited and galloping, showing how strong and healthy he is, getting here and there before the saddle and all the guards will be put on him. Only God who can show who the victor will be. Because most of the time, it's not as predictably easy. Now let's see a combination of 1,444 years and the day Jesus went into the silence of self-defense. He had always participated and he started from the very, very first directive in Goshen. Exodus 12, 14. This day shall be a day of remembrance for you. You shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord throughout all your generations. You shall resolve it as a perpetual ordinance. That's the Lord's Supper. 
when he was doing it that day, he said, I tell you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now until that day when I drink it anew with, the, with you in my father's kingdom. He connected with the past. He started the future. Next point. Before he went to the silence of self-defense on Monday, Thursday, he demonstrated feet washing. Symbolic, John 13, 8. Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. And Jesus answered him, if I wash you not, you have no part with me. With me. So the Savior's cleansing is just the equivalent of feet washing. You cannot get there unless Jesus Christ has cleansed you. And in the symbolic two reasons that fish, the feet washing will stand for is a renewed cleansing that, only, that comes from only Jesus Christ. Secondly, it's an opportunity to celebrate reconciliation. You cannot start washing somebody's messy, messy feet without saying, see what you did to me yesterday. So it's a platform of reconciliation with another member before communion, before Lord's Supper. It's to prepare us as people who are spiritually cleansed and ready. So is what he's saying is that you ought to reconcile, John 13, 14. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, he ought also to wash another's feet. For I've given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. So feet washing is a demonstrated platform for reconciliation of one another. In addition, on Monday, Thursday, at the Lord's Supper, he demonstrated that they should get done with malice. Verse 21 of John 13. 14. Truly, truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. There's no point of smelling or having a grin. You know, there is a laughter, there is a smile, there is a grin. There is no point just demonstrating a grin on your face when you are breathing venom that's almost making you explode. So before I went to the silence of self-defense, he got done with malice. I can see backbiting demonstrated. Psalm 15 verse one, Lord who shall be able to tabernacle with you, who will dwell in your holy, holy hill. Holy hill, tabernacle is mobile altar. And the psalmist answered in verse 3 of Psalm 15, he that backbites not with his tongue. You can see that fellowship, the man is, the man is turning his back. Those two ladies are giggling, that's because going, it happens in fellowships. Somebody who does not take a reproach against his neighbor. So fit washing, the peace way. Is to make is to give God's courage to tell people you hurt me the other time. Furthermore, Monday, Thursday, before he went to defense, he assisted them to get done with superficial Christianity, presumption. He predicted to Peter that he would deny him thrice. Peter was with his sword. Peter fought on that day, but he still denied him. We presume that our Christianity is deep. He showed him that our Christianity may be more shallow than we think. He warned him. He was to deny him because of fear. John 13, 21 to 33, 36 to 38. So Monday Thursday was the day he touched on superficial Christianity, even when we thought we were leaders and we were okay. Monday Thursday, was where the capital weapon of love was handed down. Love is a weapon, you know, that you love one another as I have loved you. I'll demonstrate to you that love is not just an emotion, it's also a weapon. Paul said, oh, no man anything, but to love one another. For he that loves one another has fulfilled the law. It's easier to love people who are generous. 
It's easier to love people who are kind. It's easier to love people who do us good. It's more difficult to love those who are looking for our downfall. Bamboo says, let no debt remain outstanding in your life except the continuing debt to love one another. What more about this love? See the way it's arranged in the, in, in the shape of the arts of 1 Corinthians 13, 4 to 7. Love is patient. Love is kind. This is the identity that we are commanded to exhibit. It does not boast. It's not proud. It does not discern others. It's not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. That's difficult if you have a good memory. Love does not delight in evil. It rejoices with the truth. It always protects. It always trusts. It always hopes. It always preserves. You cannot say love is stupid. After being betrayed, you still want to trust. How can this type of love come? Well, this is a practical weapon. To practicalize love as a weapon, Romans 12, 20. If your enemy is, it starts with a but. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. For in so doing, you will heap fairy coals on its head. In other words, if you practicalize love, you don't need any other weapon for heaven to take over your matter. And let me tell you the only way this love comes, if you are not, if you are awake, Romans 5.5, 5, the only way this weapon comes, I will say is hope does not put us to shame. Hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So if you allow, if there is a space for Holy Spirit in your heart, it will not be difficult for you to exhume love. If there is none, you have a hard task. No matter how much reality you make, the human flesh does not naturally love. But then the battlefield is our mind. Because then the next weapon I want to demonstrate to you is the word of God. You can see this man like a space astronaut with all his head covered. The weapons of our warfare is 2 Corinthians 4, 2 Corinthians 10, 1, 5. The weapons of warfare, they are not carnal. They are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts us itself belt against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought. I will stop there. And in the morning, I don't know if it happens to you, when, you're, when you are not chewing, memorizing, talk, taking the word of God, you have a lot of recall of negative thoughts. That's the devil. And you render captive to obedience every thought, to obedience of Christ. Our mind is a battlefield. The devil will remind you of all that who has failed you. He will remind you of possibilities of what they are doing, even when that's not true. So when we're talking about the world, Monday, Thursday, and Christian warfare reminds us of other weapons that one preacher has listed as seven. What are the weapons? The word of God, worship, prayer, the name of Jesus, fasting, our testimony, and thanksgiving. The last meal that Jesus took was a blood supper until he was crucified almost one day later, next afternoon. See this man next, see this man with all the combat outfits. So our warfare has an outfit. And you can see this man where no arrow can penetrate. Every outfit is wearing in this combat outfit is woven by the word of God, element of salvation. Let the word of God will dwell in your hearts. Shield of faith. Faith comes by hearing the word of God, Romans 10, 17. Sword of the Spirit, the word of God. Belt of truth, Ephesians 6, 14. John 17, 7 says, and divided by the truth, the word of truth. 
shoes of the gospel of peace wherever you go. Pray always in the spirit, it's always part of your head. So when you're talking about Ephesians, the process from 10 to 18, he's talking about every, every, every outfit, every, everything we wear for, in this outfit is made, is woven by the word of God. No wonder Nehemiah, even before he was taught, in the year that of four, verse 23, when they were building the wall of Jerusalem, he demonstrated it. So neither I, nor my brethren, nor my servants, nor the men of God who followed me, none of us put off our clothes, saving that everyone put them off for worship. Our weapon of our warfare is to be born 24 7. Either in worship, in the word, in prayer, in using the name of Jesus Christ, is to be born 24 7. See Jesus at the Garden of Gethsemane. Matthew 26, 42. My father, if it's not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. See him prostrate and weak. Matthew 26, 39. He went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, Oh, my father. So Monday, Thursday, we celebrate it as the day of the enacted thing. That was when he went through the te- the most significant warfare of his life. Because when your battle is not worn on your knees, in the daytime, it will, it will just appear as if something was coincidental. No, the real battle is won when we're alone with God praying. It is the spiritual that dictates the physical. Monday, Thursday, and Christian warfare. He was sweating like blood. You can see the one on the left hand. An angel came to comfort him. He was still wearing all the, you know, all these combat outfits in Isaiah 59, even towards the end. He put he wore his element of salvation. He, did, he put it on himself. There are times when you may have to lose out. All the disciples are further off. The inner disciples are close by. All of them were sleeping. Jesus was sweating it out, and God was saying, no, you have to go and die. So that's why, Christian, that's why I put it in bracket, you must die. So there are times when in spite of all we seem to have done, or we seem to be doing, the unexpected, so the, the undesirable still happens. You see, it all came, and this is where Monday, Thursday, emphasizes the condemnation of ministry slumber. Why are you sleeping? He asks them, get up and pray so that you won't enter into temptation. They were sleepy. Don't ask me if all of them did not run away on the day of crucifixion. No, you don't go back to find a, a job to do. What you do in the spiritual dictates how far you could go in the physical. And many times we have made it stronger, either economic downturn, discouragement, unanswered prayers, or just weariness of the soul, we slip off. Monday, Thursday, and Christian warfare. Here's the piece of betrayal on the left side, right side of the screen. You can see this piece of betrayal, I means ammonite, I means Highly weaponized soldiers. Somebody came and singled him out for a kiss of betrayal. Even when the kiss of betrayal come, remember that you are supposed to wear your armor night and day. Because if human reaction were to follow, then you would behave like Peter, cutting off head. Yes. But if God would be the one to take control, what you will say, what you will ask, and how you react will be given you from above. When you come to Christian warfare, Paul was not without his own tongue in the flesh. Prayed, fasted, I implored the Lord three times because of this tongue in my flesh. By the time he did not allow God to rest, God told him the reason why, even though I've received such wonderful revelations from God. So to keep me from becoming proud, 
I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me and keep me from becoming proud. That's a hard part to recognize. That's a hard thing to accept. My grace is sufficient for you, the Lord said, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Paul got to know that towards the later part of his career, his ministry career, Jesus got to the garden of this ceremony, gets money for hard parts towards the latter part of his life. And many times there are people who are children of God who cannot explain why such things should happen to them. There are a few things that God only can explain the details in spite of our warfare, you know, struggles. Now, Monday cross, Thursday and Christian warfare, is this again, Christians seek ye not yet repose. Why are you sleeping? He asked them once, three and four times, three times. So it takes prayerful, spirit filled Christianity to do it the Jesus way. Because when Peter now became violent, Simon Peter having a sword threw it out and smote the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Marcos. Then said Jesus to Peter, put up thy sword into the sheath. The cup which my father has given, given me, shall I not drink it? Then the band of the captains and the officers of the Jews took him and bound him. But not because, not before the next photograph, where he did the last miracle there and put back the mark and the air back to Marcus' body. Doing it Jesus' way takes courage, takes grace, takes the impulse of the Holy Spirit. Monday, Thursday, what are the challenges? The challenges of the Monday, Thursday is to start from the, from the name, a new commandment. Let me start with the new covenant. The old covenant has to do when I see the blood in Goshen. The new covenant, Jesus spelled it out. Luke 22, 20. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood which I shed for you. He pronounced the new covenant on that day. So Monday, Thursday, the new covenant went with the new covenant. He's also went with a new directive. Love one another, a new commandment I've given you. There was a new commandment. There was a new covenant. This is another third directive. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Three news. New directive, new covenant, and new Covenants, new covenants, new commandments, new directive. So, so many things happen on Monday, Thursday, not just with feet washing. Indeed, another new proclamation, for a fourth new. Because in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 26, for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the last death until it comes. So it's a proclamation cup. It's not only go in the it's not go ye and preach to all the disciples. When you are partaking of this, you are making a proclam new proclamation. Four things: new covenant, new commandment, new directive, new proclamation. All on Monday, Thursday. A fifth one: new discoveries. What are those discoveries? He taught it long ago in John chapter six. He just said to them, "Very truly, I tell you." Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. New discoveries. A lot of miracles happen at the, the Eucharist, at the Lost Supper. That was that new discovery we were to make made a lot of people. Get back from following, I will, I will become cannibals. He said it proverbially 
until he gave it on the on monitor. That this is the cup of my new. In this this cup is the covenant of a new covenant in my blood. So unless you drink, you have no life. And if you drink it, I you have eternal life, and I will raise you up at last day. It has to do with rapture. It has to do with eternal strength. It has to do with discoveries. It has to do with the grace that comes from the Lord's Supper. Monday, Thursday, and Christian warfare. The disobedience puts you on slippery grounds. You can see that caution, beware of slippery surface. Disobedience puts you on slippery ground. Second Corinthians 10, 6 says, we have every, every, readiness, every readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled, it's complete. When your obedience is not complete, disobedience puts you on slippery ground. 90% obedience is still disobedience. 99% obedience is still 1% disobedience. And Luke 21, 19, Jesus Christ said, in your patience, you will save your souls. So Monday, Thursday, has grouped together like an amalgamating glue. So many things happening concurrently or fulfilling what has been said before. Monday, Thursday, and Christian warfare shows the supremacy of the divine wisdom. And that's the hidden wisdom of God, 1 Corinthians 2, 7 and 9, 7 and 8. But we speak of the wisdom of God in the mystery. The hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew. For had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. If Satan knew shedding Jesus blood would get him into trouble to come and seize the key, he would not do so. So Monday Thursday was a preparation for the wisdom of God in supremacy. <clears throat> Monday Thursday. You see, you cannot be a disciple without discipline. <clears throat> the Bible says, Hebrews 12, 5 to 11. My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline. And do not lose heart when he rebukes you. Because the Lord disciplines those he loves and he chastens everyone he accepts as his son. Disciple discipline, you come from the same, same word. Now see how it has come out for Jesus Christ. John 14, 31. He said, and there are no exceptions when it comes to discipline. And it's not only those who go wrong that are disciplined. There's a discipline as part of training without you going wrong. John 14, 31, Jesus said, but that the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father gave me commandments, even so I do, arise, let us go. And when you read Hebrews 5, 8, and 9, you can see the thorns of his, on his head. Though he were his son, yet learned he obedience by things which he suffered, and being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. God said, stay there. He had to wear the thorn of crown. So their discipline was consonant on the reason that he needed to obey. What are your self-assessments and what are mine? You were bought with a price, 1 Corinthians 6.20. You were bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit which are God's. God is owner of our body, is owner of our spirits. So ourselves is our to ask ourselves, to what extent are we glorifying God in our existence? And when you see Matthew 5, 19, that makes me fear a lot. When people come to me, you know, in the Anglican church in those days, not up to now, it's only the bishop that can give dispensation in certain situations that are the only one who can grant you to be married if you divorce. They are very odd things. And I say, look. I, don't, I cannot go against what the Bible is saying. Whoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and teach others to do so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever shall do and teach them shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. It's our assessment in all these teachings of Monday, Thursday, 
is to ask ourselves, are we planning to be least or to be great in the kingdom of heaven? You can see that sports, call it World Cup, call it World Olympics, let us run with, our, with perseverance. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, the race that is set before us. There is a race that is set before me, part of which I'm doing. We are surrounded by such great cloud of witness. Let us let throw off everything that hinders and also sin that easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance, the race that is man before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher. Everybody has an assignment for God. So before we go into discussion, let me end this Monday Thursday talk with John chapter 13 and verse 35, 34 and 35. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another even as I've loved you, that you also love one another by this. All men will know that you are my disciples if you have love one for the other. 